All right, we've been doing a series called The Truth About, and this one here is a life changer. When I learned about this, it changed the way in which my relationship with God became. It also changed my relationship with me living in the world, but not of the world, and it changed my attitude towards the enemy. I began to realize that he's a blowhard and a liar. And most of the stuff he tells us is not true. And if there was any truth to it, the only way that you would think there might be truth to it is you feel it could happen because you've been a terrible person. How many here prayed this morning? Well, you're forgiven. So guess yesterday's gone. Why are you bringing up fluffy? Bringing up your past all the time. Yesterday's gone. Now, there might be some situations that we really need to have fixed, but our consistency and our faithfulness to God's going to get that done quicker than us trying to figure it out on our own. Okay, our covenant with God. Everyone say covenant. All right, how many have a Bible with you today? You notice that in your Bible, there's an old covenant or old testament and a new testament. The word testament means covenant. And covenant means testament. Let me bring in a couple more words to help you understand. It is a contract. The highest contract that can be made between two parties. Hello. And the contract was so high and so regarded that if you broke it, you're subject to death. Hello. So that kind of paints the picture to what I'm going to share. And then I'm going to tell you a story about Stanley and Livingston. Do you remember who Stanley and Livingston was? Oh, history. Get into your history. Stanley and Livingston were archaeologists, and they wanted to study and map Africa. Okay, so we'll just leave you with that thought because I haven't quite got to their story yet. All right, so today we're going to share the scripture about the covenant, the highest contract between us and God could ever be made. There are some very powerful aspects to the covenant, and we need to be aware of what they are for us so we can understand who we are. Amen. The child of God needs not to be kept in the dark anymore. We've been kept in the dark through religion. Amen. Now, say the word covenant with me. Say contract, say testament. Okay, all the same word, okay? All right, so catch this. The word covenant, testament, contract, here in this case, means to cut where blood flows. To cut where blood flows. And you might say, whoa, yeah. And if you study some of the things maybe you saw on a movie or through history, maybe that you'll know that a lot of people, though, they'll... they'll cut their palm there and they'll mingle the blood and there's a covenant between two people. Where did they get that? They borrowed it from God. And the time that it was when you cut a covenant, that means that both parties have to bleed. Hello? Say both parties have to bleed. Now, folks, there's a problem with this because as we get into this, you're going to find out that God can't bleed. God can't die. God can't be wounded. God's never lost a war. So he has to have somebody that can bleed for him. Are you with me? I'm just setting you up right now with a picture. Hopefully that when I share all this with you, it'll explode and it'll become a revelation. Now, folks, Having a revelation of Scripture is better than just reading your Bible. You can read your Bible. Please do. Please do. But as you're reading your Bible, once in a while, you'll notice something come right off of the page and really speak to you. That's called a revelation, or that's called, you know, a revelation with the anointing, so it becomes real. When God does that to you when you're reading Scripture, of course, the devil will keep you from reading, and it pops off the page like that, and some of you go, whoa, that's pretty cool, God. It's yours. You own that. Satan won't ever be able to take that truth from you. So when you study your Bible, you want revelation concerning the word of God, concerning your personal walk. Say amen, somebody. 
That's what Satan doesn't want you to have. Because God loves you so much, he wants to instruct your personal walk so that you become a success and rise above the problems of this world. And the tempter and all the other crud that's out there. Can you say amen? But we got to follow our shepherd. We got to connect to him. We got to yoke up with our shepherd. Can you say amen? amen? So catch this. So to cut a covenant means to cut where blood flows. God cannot bleed. All right, so we're going to have a good time showing you how powerful God is in you and the covenant that God gave you. You want to learn? Okay, let's learn this, okay? A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, the New Testament or New Covenant can't be broken. Make a note of that. The New Testament can't be broken. No matter what you do, whether you live for God or not, you cannot break this testament because you had nothing to do with it. This testament was made by God and God his son. And both of them are perfect and never make a mistake. So therefore the covenant is perfect. It's settled in heaven. And it's only up to us to believe in God and get in on what God has done. Amen. Now Satan messes our mind up. Oh, yeah, you're so unworthy. God will help you, but don't expect him to really help you. <laughs> Why do we believe stuff like that? Because we live in a fallen planet that's filled with lies. And folks, if you haven't noticed, a bunch of people are believing them and spreading those lies, and they think they're telling the truth. Turn on CNN or MS. DNC. <laughs> Hello. Now, I'm not against any of those organizations, but a person that doesn't know God personally is not going to preach a message of truth. It's going to be mingled with all kinds of stuff. And see, Satan's open that we won't be able to figure out what's being said. What's being said is he's getting ready to take over. He's getting ready to show up right on the White House lawn. He's getting ready to announce himself. But I want to tell you the exciting thing about it is you and I are not going to be here. Because when he shows up, we go up. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When he shows up, we go up. He's the prince of power of the air. And when Jesus shows up in the clouds, he's going to be slammed down on the earth. The Bible says in Revelation. And woe to the people on the earth. And we're going up to be trained for seven years to ride back with him and establish the millennial reign. That's who you are. Now, you're going to let the enemy talk you out of that? No way, Jose. Point two. In order for us to get on this covenant, we by faith accept Christ, then our flesh can be accepted by God, marked, sealed, and covered by the blood and by God's robes of righteousness, and we are given the covenant seal. Say, I've been given the covenant seal by Jesus Christ. I wear him around. Okay? Say, say I got that. Now, I just set a stage for you. Let's talk about Stanley and Livingston. Well, Stanley and Livingston were archaeologists. They're mapping Africa. They came into the place together in southern Africa, and they, they got to meeting, going through all, and getting all their equipment and everything like that. And Livingston went first into Africa. And Stanley's going, Where'd he go? He didn't leave any. Where he's going, it's going to travel. So he decides, I'm going to go find my, my friend. Right? And so he gets this group together, he gets his interpreters together, and they get ready. And so they go and they, they, they go to try to get into Africa, and they're stopped right there. And, and the interpreter says, You can't go right into the inner parts of Africa because it's guarded by all these warlords and all these people that don't let people just in. You've got to have a covenant to get into Africa. I said, You've got to have a covenant to get into Africa. So, Stanley, who didn't know, but Livingston was already in Africa, so evidently, he must have cut a covenant. So, getting past that, Stanley says, okay, so what do I have to do to get into Africa to find my friend Stanley, my Livingston? 
He says, you got to cover a covenant, but you got to cut a covenant with the most powerful tribe in Africa that's known all throughout. Because we don't know where Livingston is. It could be anywhere in there. But we want to go to the main man and get his covenant, his agreement that we can go into Africa. And you'll say, wow. Now, the inter interesting thing about it was, when Stanley, Stanley went, he was stopped every time. And so he looked at his interpreter and says, what do I do? He says, you got to cut the covenant with an African high priest and gave the name and everything like that. This guy is fierce. They're afraid of him and his tribes for the longest time. So if you get a covenant with him, you got free access to the whole Africa. Yeah, that's great. So what do I got to do? He says, you got to cut yourself. And he's got to cut himself, and you got to mingle your hands together and drip it in the glass and take a little sip. Now, I know it's perverted, please. This is a perverted form of the true covenant, okay? But you did take a little sip today, didn't you? <laughs> well, you're gaining on, aren't you? You're going to catch it. All right, so, so he says, man, I don't want to... I'm going to cut myself. He says, but according to the covenant, you could have a substitute. Somebody can cut the covenant to represent you, Stanley, and I'll do it for you. The interpreter says, I'll do it. Now, everything I'm saying to you will bear witness here in a minute, okay? So he made and cut a covenant. When he cut the covenant, they mingled the blood. Then some words are exchanged. Now, You'll find this in your Old Testament Bible. There's a place called the Mount of Blessing and the Mount of Cursing. And when the covenant was cut back in the day of the Hebrews, that half of the Israelites were on Mount of Blessing and half of the Israelites on Mount of Cursing. And their job was to bless and to curse and let everybody know, blessed are those who believe in God, blah, 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 bless, 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 bless. And the curse says, curses are those who break God and come against God, blah, 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 blah. And you say, why are they doing that? Because it's part of the covenant. So the tribesman, the, the leader, elder, blessed him. And Stanley blessed him. And then they're going, and Stanley's thinking, maybe this is over with. Wow, that was pretty cool. It wasn't very, you know. And then the guy started cursing him. And he goes, what's he doing? The interpreter has to tell him, he's cursing you. What's he doing that for? He says, this is what's going to happen to you if you break the covenant. So you better think about Stanley to obey the covenant and do what it says, and you'll have peace in Africa. And so they went on their journey. And they came up to one warlord. It was so fierce. They thought, oh, man, we've had it now. And then his interpreter walked out and lifted up his, his hands. And there was the mark on the hands where they had cut the covenant. I can think of Jesus having nail holes in his covenant hands. I can think of you when you sit there with the hands on your lap. They should be up saying, I'm a covenant man. I'm a covenant man. I'm a covenant child. Lift your hands and say, I'm a covenant child. When you do that, things change. So let me tell you the quick rest of the story. So, Everything was fine, but this fierce thing, you know, he says, yeah, I could cut myself too, you know, I'm making it all. And then, one of the things done in the covenant is exchanging of gifts. How many know that when we accepted Jesus, there was an exchange of gifts, our life for his? And so what they gave him as a gift, Stanley, now we're talking about, they gave him a staff. Not just any staff. This staff was the most powerful staff. And everywhere you go in Africa, you hold up the staff. And all the people will recognize that you are a friend of the most powerful man in Africa. And if you dare do anything to Stanley, he's going to rip you and your family and your relatives on down to the third generation a new one. That's pretty powerful. 
So this guy, he, he said, oh, I could cut my hands. and So as soon as he grabbed the, 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 the staff and he held it up, all of these Africans fell to the ground. Who, who, your friends, blah, 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 what's his face? Who, he says, you better move out of my way. I'm going to find my friend Livingston. So I just told you just the quick version of that. And folks, Jesus Christ is greater than any tribesman, any king. And by the fact, he is your king. And when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, he cut a covenant. And turn that covenant over to you. And all you need to do is lift up the name of Jesus. Lift up your hands. Lift up your eyes. When you do that, Satan sees you have a covenant. And he backs off. I hope you're getting this. You see, because a lot of us Christians, we came up in the charismatic movement with no idea how powerful we actually are. Everything was a whoopee. Yes, we're under the agape love of God. Sloppy agape. <laughs> you remember those days, don't you? Everybody was... <laughs> no basic foundation, no understanding of the word of God, but we were all sloppy agapes. Amen. All right, so let's go on. Now, I just set, again, the stage for you. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at the fall of man for a quick. Genesis 3. Now, do you believe God loves us so much? Amen. He made us for what reason? So we can have fellowship with him out of our own heart. Not forced to, just so we can have fellowship with him. And he made us in his image and after his likeness, correct? But something happened. Satan came into the garden. Folks, we got to get rid of this weird Sunday school stuff. The devil, you know stood about seven to eight foot tall and looked like a snake. He stood on two feet. Okay? He's called an archon where we get archangel. Okay? The archons are a type of angel that God created to do a lot of work. Hello? And, of course, some people say that Lucifer was like his second in command. I kind of lean that way. But we don't have anything to surely say that. And so God put his best man into the earth to get the earth ready for who? Everyone go, me. You are God's star creature. Now, that's not to say that God doesn't love everybody else, but he made you after his image, after his likeness, so that you could fellowship with him on his level, not to be a god, but to, on his level spiritually, you were light creatures. You're clothed in light. When Adam and Eve were created, their literary clothing was light. It was so bright you couldn't see inside. Now who's light? And has no darkness at all. So when we were created, we were created after God's image. And he's a light God. He's not a dark God. Dark winner. Now you're done through the dark spring and you're going through the dark summer. You tell the dark people, I'm coming for you in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, wherever light goes, darkness runs. So quit sitting in your house with a mask on. Get out there and preach the gospel. Say amen, somebody. <laughs> Are you mad at me yet? Do you love me? All right, so let's get into this, okay? So in the beginning, we know what happened. Adam and Eve committed high trees and they fell. Satan, now listen, this is where you really need to listen. Okay, Satan, nature entered the flesh of man and that's why we age and get sick. It entered the flesh of man and then sealed the spirit off so there was no more fellowship between God the Father and God the Son. Here's one more little fact that you might not know. From then on, they were driven out of the garden. And it isn't until after Genesis 8 did they begin to call on the name of the Lord again. Now, we know the story, don't we? Starting at Genesis 6 all the way to Genesis 8, we have Noah's flood. We found out that these fallen archon angels came down and had sex with human beings 
producing an offspring. Everyone say offspring. They're called Nephilim. Everyone say Nephilim. It just simply means born not of God, fallen ones. Satan is a fallen one, okay? But see, there's a difference between the Nephilim, the offspring, and the angels that fell. Somebody said, well, how can angels have sex? There's, there's no male and female. I tell you what, Mr. Religion. It says they left their estate. In other words, they left the way God made them, and they became like men. See, it's time to study. Time to find out what we're dealing with out there. How to put them to flight. Did you know, one more thing. All through our America, Ohio, New York, and everything, they have these things called mounds, burial mounds. They say the Indians made them. But they're thousands and thousands of years old. They're full of giant bones. There's one in Ohio called the Serpent Mound. Who's the serpent? Yes. Hooked up. They're hooked up in the same way as the great stone hinge is in Europe. There's a stone hinge in Connecticut with the same markings and everything. Who did all that? Well, sleepy Christians, Satan did. Because when God made this planet, he made it for us. He says, this is yours. When Satan heard that he wasn't going to be number two man for God, remember he was the number two man, his job was to get this planet ready, and he found out that he was not making it ready for himself. Listen to me. He was making it for you. And immediately Satan says, I'm not having that. And declared war on God. And that's the problem we're suffering with. Satan says, no, no, no. You're not going to bring a man inferior to me who looks like you to put me in my place. No, I declare war. I will, I will, I will. God says, <laughs> but see now we suffer with it. You can go all the way out to the edge of Pluto in our universe and find out Satan got that far before God threw him down. When he threw him back onto the earth, it ripped through all the planets, destroyed one, and it came down to the earth. The earth twisted, froze, and that's why we have dinosaurs and, and behemoths and everything, palm trees frozen in our poles because the earth shifted. How many here didn't know that? Isn't it nice to know this stuff? Okay, how does the covenant come in? Back to Genesis. After they fell, what did God do? All right, you ate. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. Blah, 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 blah. No, he says, did you eat of the tree I told you not to eat of? Everybody think God put that tree in there? No, Satan messed with it. He turned it into something to make anti-God people. About well, time you get out of that religion. God did not put a plant in the garden to make you turn against him. Just to see what you're going to do. How dumb is that? He knows what you can do, right? Okay, so they ate of it. So when God showed up like he always did in the cool of the day, Adam, where are you? And he's hiding in the bushes. He's freaked out. He's covering himself with fig leaves. And, he, and God says, have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat thereof? Yes. So what did God do? Uh, let's just wipe you out and start anew. No. God killed an animal, cutting of the covenant, where blood flows, and took the skins and covered Adam and Eve and made a covenant with them. That's how God responded to their fall. When you fall and make a mistake... God wants to cover you and help you get up. He's not going to put his finger in your face and say, I don't like you anymore because you're a rotten person. You know better than that. Let him help you get up and walk because he's got, you've got a covenant. So he surrounded them with blood. Now the blood is very important because the blood protected God from the foulness of man and protected man from the power of God. Remember in the Old Testament, they died when they handled the power of God wrongly. 
They died. And why was God carried around in a box? Because if he was let up, everybody would have died. So the priest went in, prepared himself with blood, got himself all ready, and hopefully he's right with God so he could drip the blood of the covenant over every year over the mercy seat. And so the people who every year look forward, they all gathered in Jerusalem waiting for the priests to come cleanse them from their sin. Aren't you glad we're in the New Testament? Because if you blow it, you can say, God, forgive me. I am sorry. Boom. Lord, I really got upset today. And God says, well, ask me and I'll cleanse it out of you. You have not because you ask not. No, God, I don't want to ask you. I want to deal with it myself. Yeah. All right, so let's move on. Genesis. So, you know the story. And they heard the sound of the Lord. This is verse uh, 8 through 13. And they heard the sound of the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves for the, from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to Adam, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. Where'd fear come from? Yeah, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, God said to him, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat of? Then the man says, it was the woman you gave me God. <laughs> he blamed God and he blamed the woman. Folks, Christians. When you make a mistake, don't you blame things. You take your own blame and say, God, forgive me. And you'll get healed and taken care of quicker than you playing the mind game. Well, it was, it was my wife. She got me upset, God. And then, and then she wouldn't leave me alone. She kept hitting the blah, 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 blah. No, God, I blew it. And I'm sorry, and I need your help to, to not blow it anymore. You see how quick that is? And God goes, all right, let's go. You see, God doesn't look at our messes. He looks at the potential and the goodness that he's placed in you. He's put himself in you. So would you show him once in a while that he's there? <laughs> you who sleep through services. Quit picking on me, Pastor Kerry. Hey, I didn't know you're sleeping through services. Moving right along. So verse 11, he says, Who told you you were naked? All right, so we're going to drop all the way down to Genesis 3. Look at verse 21. This is what God did for them. In verse 21 of Genesis 3, he says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. God, listen, I'm going to say this to you, and you're going to have to ask God about it. What you choose to conceal, God will expose. But what you unveil before God, he will cover. If you're open and honest about your life, how much it needs to be fixed, he will cover you. He'll sew skins, and he'll clothe you with Jesus Christ. But you to run around making excuses, him and Han and everything like that, you're going to kind of go with it for a while until you come to the end of yourself. Everyone say, come to the end of yourself and do it quickly. Really, because myself is the real problem. The devil needs me to mess me up. And if I'm not listening to the stranger, stranger danger, that he can't tell me anything that's going to mess me up. Then the only other thing I suffer with is the things I need to discipline in my body, and God will help me with that. So guess what? There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the life that is in Christ Jesus has set me free for the law of sin and death. Now you and I choose to follow Jesus and walk with him. 
and we choose not to look at the faults of others, but rather at our own to take before the Lord. So from now on, make a commitment with me that you're not going to point out other people's faults. You're going to point out yours before God. Now we all, look up at me. We all are learning about ourselves. This is not the unpardonable sin. But you might just got a revelation that says, whoa, I've been doing that a lot. Well, then you go to God and say, Lord, help me. And God says, great, let's work on that. Do you see, real condemnation there, huh? But if you are in a, a service like this and the preaching is good and suddenly you feel condemned, that's Satan dumping on you. You don't blame me for that. I'm giving you good news. But there's a natural part of our thinking that wants to put us down all the time. Are you one of those guys that says, yeah, that was stupid. What a stupid person you are. And your own brain's telling you that. That's not you. That's the devil doing that. All right, let's move on. So God cut the first covenant with Adam and clothed them. God's no respecter of persons, folks. If he did it for them, he'll do it for you, and he did. All right, so let's move on to my next scripture. I don't preach myself happy. Genesis chapter 16, the covenant of promise. So really what needed to happen, I skipped some notes, but what really needed to happen is when God created this earth, who did he give this earth to? He gave it to us, didn't he? But who did Adam and Eve give it to? They gave it to the devil, didn't they? Folks, you need to read your Bible. So that would be like if I had a house, I made the house, I built the house, it's my house, but I choose to rent it to my nephew. I made the house, the house is mine, but I rent, I sell it to my nephew. Now it's his house, even though I made it. Now you have the story of the earth. God made the earth and gave it to Chauncey. (laughs) Gave it to us. Right? So once you own a house, you can do with it whatever you want. And and here's a little quickie. When you give somebody a gift, don't tell them how to spend it. What a dumb thing. (laughs) Give them a gift. Then don't tell you how to do it. (laughs) Come on. So anyway. So... God gave up the house, the earth, to Adam. And Adam was conned out of it by the devil. So whose earth back then was it? Satan. The problem is, and you guys better study, because you're going to want to question me, God was thrown off the planet. Satan says, out, buddy. And God has to follow his own words and his own character and nature. He has to obey himself. God cannot just do whatever he wants, do whatever he wants. He can't lie. He can't kill. He can't do any of those things. It's against his nature. So he says, okay. Now, God has already had a plan. Remember Genesis 3.15? He said, be the seed of the woman that's going to smash your head, Satan. But God was off the planet now. So what's he got to do? Well, in Revelation, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and open the door and invite me in, I and the Father will come into them. <coughs> this is a double meaning. Because he was off the planet. Now he's looking for anybody. This is where we're going to take up. He's looking for anybody that will call on him. And I told you, people stopped calling on the name of the Lord since Genesis 4. Look at the corruption All the Nephilim, fallen angel mess, all the way to Genesis 8. Only eight people were survivable. Only eight people of millions weren't corrupted enough so that they can procreate more human beings. God made a covenant with Adam, with Noah, didn't he? What was it? A rainbow. Gosh, you guys. Can I take a minute on and sip this? All right, so we needed somebody to call and say, God, come into my house, come into the earth and help us, we're lost. (laughs) Exactly. And he found Abraham. 
So let me tell you a quick story. Abraham was the first Mooney because he lived in Chaldees of Ur, Ur of the Chaldees, which was a place that worshipped the moon and the sun and all the Nephilim junk. Hello? Amen. And, and Abraham was one of those bold people that says, they've got to be more than this religious stuff. Read the story. So he says, if there's a God anywhere, if there's some way to get me some help around here, I'm asking help. And guess who shows up? Almighty God. He, he announces himself as I am the El Shaddai. What do you want, Abraham? Now what we don't realize is God was just waiting for an invitation. Just waiting, longing to be invited back by somebody who lives in this planet. And Abraham, God says, okay, Abraham, I'm going to make a promise to you. I'm going to change the world through you. Hey, any of you want to call on God? Say, God! Make me into something I'm pleased. Do you know what's at your footsteps? Do you know the intensity, power of God that at your disposal? What you could do with God working? You need to get to a place where you get the training and not this religious stuff. Commit. Amen. You know it's burning in your heart. You know it. You could just, oh, what is that? Same stuff burning in my heart. Except I'm ahead of you a little bit in age. <laughs> now, the covenant of promise. Everyone go with me to Genesis chapter 15. We're going to make this quick. Boy, look at how much I talk. My dad shouldn't have said that I have the gift of God. Let me see. Okay. All right. So this is the story about the covenant God made with Abraham. Okay, so then he said to him, Genesis 15, 7 through 12. Then he said to them, I am the Lord who brought you out of Earl of the Chaldees to give you the land to inherit. And he said, the Lord God has, shall, excuse me, the Lord God, how I shall know, Abraham says. Lord God, how shall I know that you've chosen me? Sounds like a human. So he said to him, bring me three Old, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, a bird, and a young pigeon, a bird. Then he brought all of these to him, and he cut them. What is the covenant? Cutting where blood flows. He cut them. Now, funny thing. Let me just show you quickly. He laid out the animals, three from earth, three from heaven symbolizing a covenant between God and man, heaven and earth. Say amen. amen. All right. He laid him out in such a way. How many ever seen uh, the, the letter for eternity? It, how many ever seen a, le a letter eight? If you take the letter eight and you turn it on its side and it goes like a racetrack, that's the... That's the letter for infinity. It'll go on forever and ever and ever and it has no end. That's the kind of covenant you have. Satan has but a short time. He's going to go into the lake of fire. No wonder he's so nervous, so bold, and such a big mouth. So he cut all these things. Okay, it says, and when the vultures had come down, Abraham showed it away. Well, here's what happened. Abraham fell asleep waiting for God to show up. Okay? Let's not put him down because, folks, you and I were asleep before God showed up. We were asleep in our sin. Some of you might be still asleep a little bit. You think you're all right, and yet your life is a ruined mess. Ask God to help you. I'm not going to keep you out of heaven, but it certainly will help around the confusion state. You know, that's where we, some people live. 
Not in Washington or Texas. It's a confusion state. <laughs> All right. So, okay, a couple of points. Number one, remember the word for covenant is cut where blood flows. Okay? Two, Abraham fell asleep during this after he presented these cut co covenant animal pieces. He fell asleep. All important things. So go with me to Genesis 15. Look at verse 17 and 18. 17 and 18. And it came to pass when the sun went down, it was dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch which passed through these pieces of animals. On the same day, the Lord had made a covenant with Abraham. Drop down, please, to Genesis chapter 22, 17 through 19. I'm going to wrap it all together for you, so don't panic. Blessed, I will bless you, Abraham, multiplying. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand of the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. You hear me? And the church, no gate, no weapon form against the church. The gates of hell will not prevail. Did you see what it says there? In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now he's telling Abraham. So here's what happened. Abraham fell asleep because of the oppression. Satan will put you to sleep. If you're a sleeper in church, you better pray up because Satan's putting you to sleep. Oh, I couldn't sleep last night. Well, who do you think kept you up, Bunky? Why do you have so much problems just before the day you go to church to learn things that you need? Who do you think does that? Haven't you figured it out yet? He used to do it to me all the time until I put him in his place in Jesus' name. Put the devil in his place. Remind God you have a covenant with him. Remind the devil you better back off and he will bow his knee to God, the God that lives in you. Are you excited as I am? You should be. Now you should be, after we hear this, you should be praying, God, how do I get this to practice? How do I get this working in my life? And I'm going to make sure I'm early next week at church. Why not? Because our value system, the Holy Spirit's looking what we value. If we value ourselves more than we do the word, then you're going to always be late. Because you're trying to pretty yourself up. No. Come in. Make sure you have clothes on. And get into work. <laughs> Amen. I'm just teasing you. So. All right. So let's finish up with you, okay? So. God, when he was asleep, passed through all of this. Now, the exciting thing is God the Father, the oven, and God the Son, the torch, passed through the covenant items while Abraham is asleep and then established the covenant between Abraham and God, man and God. And then what happened? God says, hey, Abraham, wake up. He says, would you like to get in? On this eternal covenant that can never be broken. One Satan cannot touch. One that it will favor you and bless the entire world. And your seed will be the Savior. His name will be Jesus Christ. Would you like in on that there, Abraham? Wiping all the stuff from his face going, yeah, what do I got to do? He says, you got to believe in me. That's it. I don't have to cut an animal. I don't have to stomp around. I don't have to weep and cry and cut myself. Nope. All you have to do is have faith in what I tell you. Obey what I say and you will be favored. Now that was a message to you. The problem is why we have too much problems in our life is we're not obeying him. You meet with him. Get your instructions. Obey what he gives you. He's only going to give you a little bit. Because he wants you to be able to enjoy yourself too. God's not making you a workaholic. That's God saying, hey, amen. Why did God give the Sabbath? So man wouldn't work themselves to death. That's the only reason he gave it. 
He didn't give it for people to make it holy. They're all sitting around going, if you don't worship on Saturday, God's not even going to accept you. You see how we make things religious? God never was talking about just a day. He was talking about someone who's going to come that will give you rest every day. Who would that person maybe be? J-S-U-S. He's my Lord and King, J-S-U-S. He's my everything. Amen. Leon Patillo. I know I'm kind of crazy up here, guys. But it's the crazy preachers that usually get things done. Because we don't conform to the religious group. We don't. Jesus didn't conform to any religious group. And yet he was the savior of the world. Now, I can't even think that I could be anyone like that. But definitely, I'm not going to be pushed into a box and a mold. My people don't even know how to live their life. Say amen, somebody. Amen. So, in Christ, which we all are born again, if you accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and saved you, the Bible says you're baptized into Christ. And if you be in Christ, everywhere Christ goes, you go. And everywhere you go, Christ goes. Make sure you go the right place. Moving right along. All right, in Christ we are Abraham's seed. Galatians 3.16 says, Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as plural, as many, but as one seed, and that seed is Jesus Christ. Galatians farther down in chapter 3, verse 26 and 27 says, For you are all sons of God through faith. Abraham, this is how you get in on the covenant by faith. When we approach God, it's by faith. We do not approach God by works, by our merit. It's by That's right. And now you know why religion can't make it. They present works. Lord, I've been a Sunday school teacher for 40 years. It's about time you bless me. Silence in heaven for a space of a half an hour. All right, so you understand. I'm a little demonstrative today because when I got up this morning, I was not feeling good at all. So I prayed, prayed, prayed through until God healed me. Why? Because I had a message to give. Who's the intimidator? Uh, amen. The devil is. God's not an intimidator. It's not even his nature to intimidate. Amen. We need to teach you more. Amen. So you join right up. We don't have anything here to join. Just come. Just come all the time. You know, leave. Don't leave Linda and I alone. You know. All right. Then Galatians 3, look at verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. See that? Hallelujah. And heirs according to the promise. Well, what did God promise Abraham? You'll be blessed going in. You'll be blessed going out. Everything you put your hands to will be blessed. You'll bless your store, bless your children. I'll bless every generation. Look it up. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, yeah. 28, okay? There's, one of my friends wrote a song called that. Mike Deese is a good friend of mine. From years, years back, he wrote one called Deuteronomy, and it's, it's in the Beach Boys thing. So sometime I'll sing it for you later on. All right, a couple of points. When we accept Jesus Christ, we accept his covenant. Can you say amen? amen. When we accept Jesus Christ, we are marked with his marking. When we accept Jesus Christ, our nature is changed. When we accept Jesus Christ... Robes of righteousness are placed upon us. And a staff is put in our hand. Stanley and Livingston, all he needed to do was hold the staff up. Christians, you're screaming and shouting at the devil. All you need to do is hold Jesus up and Satan will run in terror. Because Satan knows you have a covenant. And now he knows that you know you have a covenant. So Stanley came into Africa, and guess what? He finally found Livingston. And he goes, 
living sin, I presume, because he's only a white guy there. <laughs> Hello? And he says, yeah. He said, did you have to go when I went through to get into Africa? Yeah. He says, is it amazing? That's what Jesus Christ went through so that we could get into the kingdom. Hold up, Christ. Jesus said, if I be lifted up in the wilderness, I will draw all men nigh unto me. Hold up, Christ. You have Christ's scars in your hands, even though you can't see him. Lift your hands. Everyone, let's just lift our hands and, and show the Lord the covenant that we have. Lift your heart. Say, Lord, I'm a covenant child. I'm a covenant child, Lord. I'm a covenant child. You'll move heaven and earth because of the covenant. You see, all right. Now, tell me you didn't get blessed when you did that. Next time when you see a song says, and we all lift our hands. Don't sit there with a big mug womp. And your lip hanging out, snoring. And then tell me you don't sleep during the service. Of course, nobody does that anymore. But I tell you what, in my pulpit... Because of the sleepers, I have a squirt gun. <laughs> this is for those, I have my relatives watching. Hey, everybody. And over in Texas and New York and a few other places too. You sleeping? Could you imagine a super soaker, Jackie? <laughs> Are you beginning to sleep? <laughs> I'm sure you do. Anyway, the, the idea is, are you beginning to see how Satan's robbed us through religion of some truths that we really need to know? And I tell you what, Satan's pounding on me hard. I've been, my wife and I have been sitting in this little teeny place praying. Our commitment is, God, we're not going to ever advertise. It's going to have to be God's people saying things of God happened here. You see, because I don't ever want to be blamed of, you're advertised and Satan sent you a bunch of people. There's three people come to church. It's whom want to go to the church. Two, those are disgruntled with their other church and they come and bring their problems to your church. And then three, the ones the devil sends. So we hopefully keep one third whoever comes. Hello, are you with me? You know I'm telling you the truth. All these years of being a minister, I've seen all kinds of crazy things. But let's move right on. And finishing, we have a better covenant. So listen to me. I'm going to read rather quickly. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Listen carefully. But now he has obtained, that's talking about Jesus, a more excellent ministry, insomuch he is a mediator instead of Moses. In the New Testament, Jesus is a mediator of a better covenant. Say better covenant. Now, who says this? See, because there's people out there practicing the old covenant, waving flags and trying to become Jews. And the Bible just strictly says that's error because you're trying to leave what God went through hell and back to give you. You went back to the Old Testament where they didn't even have a Messiah. Waiting for the feasts. Come on. Now, I'm not putting it down. It's beautiful. But if they don't have the right reason why they do that, then they're just doing it in vain. God didn't say sign up and become a Jew. He says, if you be Christ, then you are already Abraham's seed. You're more Jewish than the Jewish people are. Amen. So let's go on. Which is established on better promises. So we have a better covenant established on better promises. And our job is to search them out. You see, it's one thing for a God to conceal a matter, but only kings search the matter out. And you are kings and priests in Christ Jesus. God gives you a statement. Your job is to search it out. Okay, then on down further to verse 13. And in that he says, a new covenant he has made, the first covenant is obsolete. I didn't say it. The Old Testament is obsolete. Now, what does that mean? No, it's not done away with. It's fulfilled. And so it is short. You have two covenants on your house. 
the old covenant, if it was good, you wouldn't have to have a new one. Right? So you notice we have two. The old one wasn't quite perfect. From God's standpoint, it was. From man's standpoint, we didn't measure up. But God instilled a better covenant, a promise. Can you say amen? And then my last statement is this. One of the reasons we lift our hands, acknowledge our God, is because of our covenant. It shows the enemy who we belong to. It shows our peers who we belong to. And the first test that Satan will do when you do that is you will see how loyal you are when challenged. Satan's job is to test you. That's his job. His job is to thumb his nose at God and test you hoping that you're going to run tail and split. But not me. Can you say amen? Just learn to hold Christ up when you're under trial. Hold him up. How do I go about doing that? Lift your hands. Worship the Lord. Right under a trial, instead of thinking about how horrible it is, yeah, stop thinking. Get on your face or chair where it's comfortable and start praying. You'll find the difference is 15 inches of satisfied peace from here to here. Did you get something out of that this morning? Give the Lord a praise, will you?